welcome to our webinar. It's a follow-up on our first DMP for C CDP webinar. Thank you for joining us. We're happy to have you. My name is Sammy Anderson. I'm the marketing coordinator at Softcrylic. Today's webinar is a bit of a play off our previous DMP for CDP webinar. After the first one, we had a lot of people inquiring about how do you evaluate if you keep your DMP or move to a CDP. So today our senior director of data activation, Jerry Halu, is back talking all things DMP and CDPs and he's joined with his friend and colleague, Fernando Alfaro. He's a senior technology architect at TELUS Digital. If you have any questions during the webinar or follow up about our services, you're always welcome to reach out to us at info at With that, there's a poll that's launched. So make sure that you take a look at that and put any questions you have in the Q&A or the chat. Jerry, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Sammy. That's awesome. Thank you everyone for, uh, for attending as well. Um, really appreciate that. There was a lot of feedback, good feedback that we heard uh, after the first webinar, and we're excited to drill a little bit deeper into this topic. Uh, just a little bit for people who don't know who I am. Um, I've been in, in this field for about 10 years, spent uh, around six years at Adobe within the Experience Platform or Experience Cloud at the time. Um, spent a lot of time with the DMPs and recently working closely with CDPs. Uh, today uh, at Softcrylic, we've been asked this question over and over uh, whenever we are evaluating uh, a client's uh, technology stack in terms of, hey, our CDB is something new, something we need to invest more into, uh, or the DMP I have today is something that can be used in, in a form or fashion as a CDP. Uh, and it's, it's a really hard question to answer without understanding fully the maturity as well as the use cases that the clients have. Um, so today I invited uh, a good friend of mine, Fernando, who has been doing or been in the midst of these questions. Um, and, and he's done incredible work in identifying the right path for, for his company uh, on how to, to progress and evolve. Uh, so Fernando, maybe we can kick it off with you, giving, giving the folks here a little bit more around your background, how, how you got where, to where you are today, and uh, some of your day-to-day -day, um, responsibilities at TELUS. Sure. So um, I'm Fernando. I'm in Canada, in Toronto, part of uh, the digital team for TELUS Digital, uh, one of the telecommunication companies in Canada. Um, my background is computer science. Uh, I started as a web developer, but from there, um, and I started 17 years ago in the telecom industry. So I've been lucky enough to stay in one industry and gain a lot of knowledge uh, around it. Uh, but I started as a developer. I, way back then when Google Analytics was the best new thing, uh, I implemented an analytics that got me interested in data and started developing my career towards data, uh, digital marketing, personalization, and uh, my technology background has served me well to combine those two experiences uh, moving into marketing with a technology mindset that helped me to get into Telos as a data performance uh, analyst first, but quickly moving into data engineering and technology architecture. Uh, since 2015, implementing the Adobe Experience Cloud, uh, different components of it, and how those uh, interact with the Telos uh, systems and data. Excellent. Okay, let's, let's get into it. I know there's a lot of people here who, who coming with, with a question in mind is, all right, maybe I have a DMP today and I've been pitched a CDP um, and, and how do I navigate that space? So uh, Fernando, in, in your current uh, role today, obviously you're, you're using, you have a DMP, you're using it to, uh, in, in a very interesting ways, I would say, because um, you're able to go beyond what, what a DMP is meant to do. Um, you're, you're, you're combining some of the features that could be from a CDP. Uh, but maybe what we can start with in, initially is tell us like how would you recommend for folks to first take full advantage of their DMP? Like what are the things that they should keep in mind or try to experiment with uh, to supercharge that DMP before saying, okay, you know what? this is not working, I'm just going to go and purchase a CDP to replace my DMP? Uh, well, I think uh, what's important when you have a DMP is to really spend the time to understand how the technology actually works 
uh, so you can see the value of the different components of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have your data sources, your data destinations, and the identity management or what uh, is the profile merge rules in Adobe uh, or in Manager. Understanding the how I is identity is managed in DMP is crucial for you to really figure out the potential and the limitations of a DMP, right? Uh, uh, you can start with a very, very basic implementation and not even apply a, a profile merge rule when you're just doing device-based targeting. Right. Uh, but as you start uh, doing a device graph and start identifying multiple devices and understanding how those profile merge rules influence the way that you're targeting those devices as the same person, that's a very important thing to consider. If you do that right and you understand that and how that works in combination with your data sources, you're essentially creating uh, the exact, not the exact platform, but something that can serve you well without a CDP. Right. right. Yeah, because if we think about a CDP, right, so what you brought up is a very good point because um, I, one of the, the features within a DMP, especially audience manager that I absolutely love is this profile merge ability, the ability for you to separate what is related to an authenticated profile versus what's a device level and then kind of mix and match where how many device information you want to merge together or how, many, how much of the authenticated profile you want to bring in when you're evaluating a segment. But the, the problem is it comes to, to where, where someone would say, well, but in CDP, I can do a one-to-one -one messaging because I know that this is Fernando. I know this is Jerry. Um, in, in a DMP, I, I don't. It's, a, it's a anonymous. To, to the mm -hmm. best I know is that it's tied to a person, but it's not tied to Fernando. It's tied to this device ID. There is this um, device graph associated with it. How would you, if you want to stay with, with the DMP today, how would you solve that problem, the one-to-one -one messaging? Um, would, it, would you look for a better, like a strength in the integration between the DMP and a marketing automation system? that allows you to do the the one-to-one -one messaging? How are you guys tackling that today? It's an interesting question, right? Uh, that deals a lot on the design and the distribution of your, of your personalization or how you're activating your data on DMP, right? Uh, a lot depends on the profile merge rule, uh, how you bring in the data that links it to what you identify as a person and is going to be distributed to all your digital channels. Uh, uh, if your ID on the profile merge rule is not a one-to-one -one with your account system, uh, which is one of the advantages of CDP, that you can have multiple IDs that you can target, uh, if you don't have that in Audience Manager or in, in DMP in general, it's, it's going to be a challenge and you have to work with that limitation, mm -hmm. right? That's one point. Now, on the other side, when you're uh, trying to create one-to-one -one, uh, messaging, you have the challenge of content. Marketers have to create a lot of content. Yeah. And, that's a, uh, and we worked uh, on creating our own APIs to be able to deploy targeting messaging and A-B testing at scale and not running with performance issues when we deploy this. That's a different conversation, not about DMPs, but that's what we did in order to scale. Is that but like a dynamic we, content, uh, like allows you to create dynamic content so that you don't have to create a creative for every type of campaign? Uh, that's, that's the goal. Okay. But what we did is basically separating the creation of the, of the A-B testing, for example, from the content. So the mm -hmm. content lives in the content management system. So content owners are able to build the content for different tests of different messaging without having to deal with the complexity of your A-B testing tool, for example, right? So kind of separating their concerns. But that, uh, the idea is that now that we have all the content living in the content management system, how can we make that dynamic? How we can uh, make it instead of, um, how call it like different uh, types of messages uh, separated, how can we make it components that can dynamically be combined to create content uh, at scale? Right, that's content at scale basically, right? So those two things are uh, very important when you're talking about a one-to-one -one messaging, right? Understanding how are you profiling for your digital uh, channels 
on how we're going to dynamically create content. Okay, this is, I'm glad that you brought this up because in many, there's so many situations where even talking about DMPs or CDPs, um, the, there's that perception that content, campaign management, all of it is baked into this product. Um, while end of the day, it's actually like a data hub that you're able to create audiences, then, then these audiences you can orchestrate this audience, if it shows up on this uh, medium, um, then you would know them and then you decide what you want to do with them. They qualify for this offer or that offer. But the decisioning on what offer and what content aligns with that audience is never a responsibility for a DMP or a CDP. Um, that becomes like a decision logic or a decision engine with yeah. connection to content. So, so I think this is very important and I, I think it's, it needs to be clear that migrating from a DMP to a CDP does not solve that problem. Um, you still need to have that decision making, the layer that, that, that needs to take place. Of course, from an orchestration, maybe a CDP has better control over orchestration. Not all of them do, but, but doesn't help or doesn't solve the content. Um, related to this, you, you mentioned the APIs. And APIs have become such a big deal uh, over the past, I don't know, few years. Um, Adobe is pushing the Adobe Experience platform to be Adobe uh, API friendly, right? And, and that's great. Uh, at the same time, every cloud infrastructure from GCP to Azure to AWS are, are using APIs and API friendly. You have single point solutions, whether it's Segment IO or Signal, or, or any of those are, are API friendly. But in your experience, when we say API friendly, like I've worked a little bit with APIs and there's always a painful process to even do the authentication and the tokens and token expires after 24 hours. So you need to set up the process. You need to make sure there's monitoring and QAing just so that APIs are always working properly. Um, do you think that th the idea that platforms or uh, enterprise companies are pushing to using APIs, um, is it just like a buzzword? Or in reality, yes, APIs can be super powerful that they can solve a lot of these problems. Um, coming from a technology background, uh, I would say it's my answer is probably biased, but I would say absolutely APIs are uh, transformational in the way that we do things. Uh, uh, I, I'll give you the example of uh, scaling our A-B testing, right? Because we put an API, now we are able to monitor the effectiveness of the performance of those A-B testing, right? Uh, and it is a challenge. Authentication is always uh, uh, something to deal with, although developers that are used to APIs and this microservice architecture, that wouldn't be... Uh, a problem that's a common practice for whatever API or whatever application with microservice architecture will be. So that's fine. Uh, however, all these companies that uh, are API friendly, API is still, not for all of them, but uh, a lot of the new features, they get to the API interface as the last thing. Like they will do a UI and they, will, they want you to use their tools because API is a way that for you to do your own way so you can come with a challenge that some of the latest features will take a little bit longer to be available through the API. So if you want to take advantage of those, you just need to wait, right? Uh, or push for yeah. the roadmap for the API APIs to catch up with everything else that it can be done through the user interface or the friendly user interface if you want, right? So that's one of the things that you have to consider. On the good side of an API, it gives you a lot more control and more, a more understanding of what's what's in the realm of possibilities, right? Through the API, you can integrate your own data and you can do even more, more stuff, uh, which is what we are, we are doing, right? One example for us is uh, we know that when we do batch processing for a DMP, it takes time to process. But if you use the APIs that send signals directly to the right edge server in your DMP architecture, you can activate those signals in real time. Yep. So, hey, understanding that API allows us to build that capability. 
Yeah, I, and, and I want to actually unpack that a little bit because it, it's such an important feature that many know about it, but they don't know like how to use it. So, so what Fernando is mentioning is that today in DMPs, and let's say specifically Anis Manager, you're able to onboard data uh, through a file. Uh, and this can be using your, uh, an ID that is used as an authenticated ID on your own site or using uh, someone as an onboarder as Libram. Uh, but the problem with these five, uh, those batch process is that it can take anywhere from 36 to 72 hours for this data to be available on the edges to take action on. Um, I don't think many know that because it's, it's just not as clear on what is that time. And 36 to 72 hours is kind of like a big, big window, but it is, it is isn't true. Um, Instead, you can use the APIs to emulate pushing that data similar to how you collect data from a website or app by pinging directly the data collection server. But also, you need to be careful because you can't just push it to a single edge or in a general edge um, because if that profile does not exist on that edge, it might take up to 24 hours before all the edges um, get that information. So there needs to be a careful way of doing it where identify for every profile on what edge they exist and then push the data there. It's complex. It also has its pros and cons where you cannot, if someone qualifies for a real time signal, you cannot remove them without, uh, by doing like another signal. You, you either need to wait them to expire or you need to have like a different rule associated with it. Mm -hmm. But but you guys are a living example that this is this is working for you and you're able to do this in a fashion where you don't have to be dependent on a 72 hour time frame. You know that someone qualified and you're able to get that profile updated in as quick as possible uh, using APIs. Yes. Uh, but it is complex, like you said, like understanding uh, where to send that signal, understanding your, uh, the edge server architecture, in this case for us, for Adobe, uh, it, it's important. Now, we are at tel a Canadian telco, so we basically care about two edge servers. So it's not a very complex uh, problem for us. And we can even guess based on their billing address what edge server is, is serving this customer. If I'm a travel agency or, a, or an airline, I'm in big trouble because my customers could be all around the world. So I don't really know where is the latest edge server that my customer has been seen for, mm. or if the next time I see him is gonna be on that edge, right? So you have to consider that whatever you do, 24 hours will be the best case scenario, at least from my perspective when you're talking with airlines. Yeah. Um, but also when we keep talking about APIs and dealing with this complexity, something important when you were trying to make a decision between building something or buying something off the shelf uh, is that when you build something, you become IT yeah. because you need to support it. Yeah. So my team has grown from being analysts putting reports in dashboards to now having to, su to support, maintain a soft software. We have APIs that have release notes that have to be backwards compatibility that have to like, deal with the uh, latest technologies that we need to have monitoring and uh, worrying about DDoS attacks and all of this uh, complexity that comes with you building software, right? That's a very good point because, and this brings me to the next question when it comes to evaluating whether you continue investing with what you have versus going and getting something off the shelf, right? So going and buying a product off the shelf, you're buying with it a team, a product team, an engineering team, and, and support, right? So things fail, this is their problem. Obviously, it's not, you don't want things to fail, but at least it's not something that you need to babysit. But when you are building something in-house, uh, it's not just building and just you move on. There needs to be, uh, um, there needs to be thought into how this gets maintained, updated, and, and also grow and scale. Um, and how do you think, like, what would be the right way to evaluate wh which way is better for, for someone who is in these shoes, right? Someone, think about, let's say, I'm sure that maybe some of the people on, uh, on the, the webinar today are marketers uh, and analysts. 
um, that they, they think that, okay, we don't know which way, but give them your perspective. Like what should they think about so that it helps them in, in knowing whether it's better to invest more in their IT or better to just go directly to off the shelf, given your experience? That's, that's a hard question to answer, but uh, I thought about it uh, and we, we keep like debating about this within the company as well, right? And um, people always talk about like data insights action, like where are you in that, in that? or I think McKinsey goes with data decision in designing and distribution, there are four Ds. And what you have to do is figure out where are you on all those? Where is your data? How good is your data? What do you need to do there? Do you have a city, do you have a customer profile that it, it, that you're using, that is used by all your channels? Maybe you already built that part, right? In terms of decisioning, what are you doing to with your data to decision? And do you have data science already in your, in, in, in in your company, you have data scientists with a data science platform that they use, that they decided that they have methods. If you don't have those things, a, uh, a TDP or something like Adobe AP could help you to leapfrog to that state, right? Because can help you a lot of that. If you have Adobe Analytics and you have that understanding, a lot of what it comes with collecting data for CDPs is following the same uh, mindset, let's say, of how to collect data from non-digital sources like streaming of data or events that you want to pass as customer experiences. So that can help you to build that part. But if you have that, then move to the other parts that you need to work on. How is your designing or the orchestration? Uh, is it complex? Uh, for example, we have very complex scripts that uh, uh, DB, DBAs or database uh, managers have to run scripts to accommodate that they have access to all the data right mm -hmm. uh, to create those lists that will be then distributed either through the dcs api to audience manager or through adobe campaign or uh, even uh, put in somewhere for outbound calling so the call center can get in sync with that but that's all built in scripts so right. you get a dependency of that kind of uh, people with that kind of talent which is it's good if you have those people so you need to look at do, do i have this or where where is my biggest problem and then the distribution or the activation of this. And we just talked about APIs, the personalization API that we built. Uh, you have challenges there. So figuring out those, where are you on those stages it will help you decide if it makes sense for you to invest on a CDP. If you already have your data in a good place and you have your, uh, this, your audience manager or your distribution with DMPs in a good place, Maybe you need to work on the data science part and the decision or in the design where we talk about uh, dynamic content. That's a big, pro a big thing that actually a CDP is not going to solve dynamic content, right? So that's a different area that perhaps you need to invest. Uh, so that's how I would look at it. Makes, good, makes a very good point. So before we, because I, I want to talk a little bit about, you mentioned like the people and the right people in place. Um, but there, there's always this question that comes up is, okay, you know, DMP sometimes live within the, the media team, or it might live within the analytics team, depending on who had the budget, who paid for mm -hmm. it. And then when you start talking about some of the stuff you're doing, these are, you know, technical stuff. They're not like a marketer friendly or marketer, um, I would say responsibility. So it starts shifting more into the IT department. Uh, especially when you say data and if there's a data lake where the databases, I mean, it's more and more sounding like an IT. Um, how do you think companies that are in the marketing department that feel that, okay, we want all these things um, and we want to collaborate with IT on building these things. Um, what would be like an advice for you on how to approach it? Uh, because, end of the day, uh, marketers might decide not to go down that, that path because they say, well, I don't want IT to own it. I want, I want this to stay within marketers so that I'm not getting you know, a bottleneck every time I need to build a new data model or I need to do 
come up with a new use case that needs a new channel, um, I can just manage that. Uh, but we know, I mean, at the same time, that also has its own limitation because you're putting your hands with, with another company that you're going to be operating on their speed, on their own roadmap, not on your own IT. Uh, but what, what is your advice on how can you bring these, these different teams together so that really, if they want to do this in-house, that this actually becomes successful? So um, at the organizational level, I think a big decision is about this trend of creating a digital branch of your company, which is uh, one of the decisions that Telf has done years ago that took us to the place that we are now. And I think it's the right decision because when you're talking about partnering with IT, uh, if they are separated still as two different uh, units of marketing and IT, they could have a good partnership that IT is still IT and they have different priorities. Uh, so when you create this digital organization and you have both living in the same, on the same roof and working together, they are not, it, it creates a better environment to grow this kind of technologies, right? That's what happened to us. We built within digital our IT capabilities, if you want, with the, the capability of understanding these technologies, building software on top of it and things like that. So uh, it, when you grow, it, you become a, a, a bigger and comes with other complexities of being part of the company, but this digital branch that grow sort of a kind of a startup ment mentality, I think that grow and helped us a lot to build what we have done. Now, Amazing. we are talking a lot about technology too, right? On the other side, uh, you probably also heard and everybody heard about like technology people and, uh, and processes, right? Uh, platform mm -hmm. people and processes, some people call it, right? So when we are talking about CDP, we're talking about technology. But if you don't have the right people that understand it and you don't have the right processes, but a lot of our problems sometimes is just process. Mm -hmm. You probably, if you look at all the technology that you have, uh, you probably have the technology to do it and you have to work on the processes, yep. right? And getting the right talent is a hard thing. All companies uh, have that problem, right? One thing that I, I like to share is how we created a program to train junior developers and uh, to be more aware of an analytics and data and uh, this side of personalization. We call it the junior analytics developer experience. So Jade, I like Jade, it. Jade, yeah. yeah. And uh, with this program, we have junior people that come and they get trained on all these technologies uh, and they get excited about this career path that perhaps when they came out from from school, it wasn't in the, on the radar uh, of development career in data and data activation, and data engineering. Uh, so it has been successful. We are on the third wave of uh, data graduates that are starting to go you know, into different units with that mentality. And that helped a lot to ease the conversations when we're talking about technologies that marketers don't understand, but now they have somebody next to them that understands good enough and is part of their team mm -hmm. that also understand their business context to help them to build something with that. So, th so that yeah. idea of like growing the talent along with the technology is key, right? Uh, 100%, 100%. I feel that um, I think in every time I do an assessment of uh, a client's technology stack, um, I always have that slide, which is it's a very cliche, right? Like people process technology. Yeah. But um, I, I'm seeing it more and more where it's, there's less interest or less, I don't think interest, but less investment happening in the people and processes uh, compared to technology. And, and I, I don't know why. I feel like it's more whether it's the sales teams are so good where they make it sound like it's always a technology problem or that's the quickest one where you can write a check and you think that that will be fixed um, or the, the best way to you know, use a budget if you're on in, mm -hmm. in a way that you need to finish a budget before the end of the year. But <clears throat> whether you're today on the DMP, moving to the CDP or you're building your own, I, I really think uh, there needs to be equally or even more effort put in into what are the right people that need to be in place? And, and also what kind of skill set they need to have? Uh, I, we don't expect, I think 
I think you brought up a good point is that to go and just hire a, a players from everywhere is going to be difficult. Um, one expensive Two, it just, it's really hard to bring people who have already had that, you know, senior experience and put them together that might actually cause more friction than working together. So it's really, I, I really think bringing a team that can grow into this together in a program such as Jade, as well as having processes that it's always clear in terms of, you know, what are our main objectives? What are the, the right ways so that when we are launching a campaign, this is the campaign that is going to go across all these channels and it's always going to follow the same form or the same process, not to be like, oh, it's last minute, we need to do this. Okay, if there's always last minutes happening, then let's figure out a process for last minutes because mm -hmm. we don't, if, if we're always rushing into launching things and things are launched without the right tracking, without the right audience, then we are just wasting Wasting, wasting. I mean, it's a waste. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to say like an email went out or to say that the campaign is live without knowing whether this campaign is performing or not is, in my opinion, is a failure. Um, so th that's, that's a very important point uh, as people are considering uh, moving or upgrading their technology is that it cannot happen. It's not going to work unless you have the right people in place with the right talent and also the processes that these, uh, that these teams can use. Yeah, great point. And to me, one one of the roles that uh, uh, helps a lot on this is uh, having a technology architect. Like ah, that's my role, so I'm going to pitch for me. But uh, allows you to have somebody that understands how this actually happens and have the conversations with the right people. Right? Uh, we have done a lot at Telos, but I cannot take the credit for it. Like a lot of very talented developers have worked on that, and having and i'm sure uh, a lot of the people that are here uh, have and can identify the talented developers on in their teams how to bring them to that how to bring them to open and uh, outside just focusing on code and look at the architecture and being trained to also see the business side of it right um so they can help to translate those business uh, use cases into how this will work with the current technology we have, and they can be, uh, and everybody is smart enough to figure out how to make it work with what you have, or come up with a recommendation of, well, this is what we actually need, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, so that kind of role is, is important, uh, especially if you have a, you need a linchpin between IT and marketing, mm -hmm. right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's a role that uh, it's worthwhile considering. And, uh, what, what I say always is that you can buy the ex most expensive guitar in the store still doesn't come with fingers, right? You need the person that needs to be trained uh, with the right talent to start, you know. To play the that. guitar, I, I agree. You're not going to hear music, good music, unless you have someone that knows how to play it. Um, one thing related to this, and this is, um, obviously it's going to be an interesting question because, um, a lot of clients will ask this to be like, okay, we don't have people in place today. Um, I know I don't have, I'm sure on staff, I'm sure on resources. Um, so I'm going to lean on my partners, partners like professional services, whether it's Softcrylic, Adobe, or any of the other uh, amazing professionals out there. Um, but then I always, my answer is great. Obviously, I'm not going to say no for business. I always want to, to have more business with clients. But for successful, to see the success and make sure that this is growing, um, there needs to be a plan put in place where you're not always dependent on your partners. Uh, because as much as a partner wants the best for you, uh, a partner can, is not fully, cannot be fully vested the same way that you have an, an employee where they're breathing and eating and dreaming this company, right? Um, so in your perspective, like how would, you, how would you plan for something like that? Would you bring your partners in a way where it's clear that yes, today as a short term, they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting because we need them, but along the same way, we have a transition plan 
that whatever they're doing is documented, it's clear, it's shadowing other people or other people shadowing them. And then eventually when this is up and running, they're gonna handhold us for a little bit, but eventually we're gonna say thank you and we are on our own. Um, do you think that that's the right way to do it? And if so, um, how would you approach that? Um, so first I think um, you always need to rely on experts and uh, companies, uh, agencies, uh, on, diff on the different aspects that we talked about into the distribution, the designing, the decisioning, the data. Uh, there are different agencies, different ex expertise on that, and they live and breathe being on the cutting edge of those technologies. So you need that because at the same time that they will not be uh, fully into the context of your company, they are the ones that you can rely on the expertise about the technologies that you are considering or you are using. So there has to be a partnership like that. You need those people. Uh, but you need to own what is yours. Like I've seen uh, experiences where like the agency owns the account, owns the data, owns the designing, and you're basically pay paying for hours. And all of that becomes a black box, which I don't know, maybe you have big pockets, that's fine, and just pay for the labor and just wait for things to happen. But a most effective way would be to partner with them, either to, and we do this at Telos, like we have our, our consultants sitting with us, or we go to their offices and we sit with them uh, to have that partnership of working together and understanding more of, on the both sides of the story, right? Uh, we own our data. Any any uh, partner that we create new technologies that we might be using, or when we review proposals, like the data has to come back to us. Mm -hmm. Like we like you can have a fantastic tool and do wonderful dashboards on your own tool, but I still have my one my data in my, on my uh, data uh, warehouse. Right, so those kind of uh, things have to happen. And when you develop good partnerships, for example, we have a good partnership with Adobe, like uh, you can work on, like I said, like when you need some capabilities to be prioritized on an API, you can have those conversations. Or you understand the roadmap better mm -hmm. and uh, you can look at the, uh, if that is still aligns with your own roadmap, if that makes sense for you and keep working with that partnership. And that means that you're investing not only a pin to that black box and hoping that everything that you're doing, it's exactly what you want, or investing on people that will understand that and that live with you and they can take over if it's necessary, right? So it's not one or the other, you need to work with both. That's awesome. No, uh, it's nice to hear how you guys have been able to, to manage um, you know, the technology, the people inside your company and also the partners so that you're getting the best out of it. I think you said something that I, I've never heard before, but it makes a lot of sense that you're, you want to pay for labor or you want to pay for really like action and just like, like you don't want to just pay for labor. Like we're not looking for people just to do things. We're looking for, for us as a company to know how to do things because this is going to be done again and again and we need to do it right. And it's not just saying, I don't wanna think about this, just go ahead and do it uh, and I'll pay this amount of money. I think that's, that's a very good way to put it. Um, okay, so let's, let's go back. We're, we're approaching the, the, the 45 minute mark. So I, I wanna go back just so that we can talk a little bit in, in just, or summarize, like what are the things to consider when you're evaluating a DMP? And I, I wanna say a few that, we kind of discuss um, uh, and, and just see what else is there. But in terms of evaluating whether to keep a DMP or a CDP, I think one of the things you mentioned is, are you using the DMP to its full power? Um, are, are some of the things that you're, you feel that are limiting for you uh, are things that can be done, such as the leveraging of the profile merge to manage identity, or the leveraging of uh, the APIs to push audiences in uh, that, that will solve the problem of the, um, uh, the real time or the latency, correct? That was one. Um, another one was um, around like, what is exactly your expectation of a DMP or a CDP? Like if it is about the, the ability to create the content 
or the ability to orchestrate, um, you need to make sure that this is actually something that is not existing in DMP today, but would it exist in a CDP? Or this is still going to be a problem when you when you migrate and when you so that you need to understand like the the decisioning engine as well as the the content that comes with it. Where does it exactly live? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a great point. And I think the third one was uh, really having the right people in the right place. So if you are today not getting value out of your DMP, is it because um, you don't have the right person managing the DMP or you don't have the right processes of, of using the DMP? For example, I've seen so many uh, implementations where clients are just pushing data to the DMP and they're overcharges um, and it's just data sitting there, thousands and thousands of segments and traits and, and it's not being used. You see it on the destination side, few segments here and there. Um, and and that, that's a problem, right? Because you don't have the right people in process that are managing the DMP. And this is gonna be exactly, I believe it's the exact problem that's going to continue to happen if you go with a new technology as a CDP, which actually might be even more complex because with a CDP, there, there's more involved. You need to understand the data model and the schema. It's not just saying push data in. Um, so there's a lot that takes um, a, a lot of thought and design that needs to go into it. That If it's lacking today, it's gonna continue to lack. Um, aside from these, do you, is there anything else that you would recommend for people to evaluate when they are thinking about the DMP versus the CDP in your, in your point. I think that something that we haven't mentioned yet is the governance and the privacy around it. Mm, and exactly. that's something that you have to consider. Uh, so far, like DM, the DMP is like audience manager, for example, uh, they, they give you the capabilities to, uh, to manage the privacy of your data. And the way I explain this to my manager is like, they are giving us the door, the locks and the keys, but we can decide if we leave it everything open. Right, mm -hmm. like that's that's basically how uh, you need to figure out how is how are you managing your governance and how the privacy uh, is looking in the future, right? With uh, GDPR, with uh, with all these regulations coming into place and changes in the browsers, a lot of what DMPs rely on then has to change. Mm -hmm. So how is uh, that going to be solved or or managed by CDPs? in a better way, the idea of having an authenticated status of uh, everybody coming to your digital presence so you don't rely on third party cookies and things like that. Right. Uh, you need to look at the privacy too and the governance of the, your data, which with tools like AP, that is that now has a user interface that allows you to much more easily to work on your on how you, you govern your data because First of all, with the schema, you're bringing the data to one place and then you can apply all the privacy regulations to all the data you have. Uh, but again, if you look at your company and say, well, we have a data lake and we actually put a good process and good uh, and people working on the governance of your data, maybe you don't need it, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, thinking on the, uh, of what happens with the future of privacy and how that will impact the current way that you're doing things, uh, that's also something that you need to consider. That's a great point. Yeah, because with a with a CDP, it actually it gets even more important the privacy, given now that you have um, anonymous and authenticated data living, you know, in a, in the yeah. same system. Um, that's something a DMP doesn't doesn't have that problem since it's only anonymous. But at the same time, that's kind of a limitation. Why a lot of people are saying. Or maybe the DMP is, is really not enough for me uh, because it's only anonymous and also with a third party cookie disappearing from iOS and IDFA now becoming, um, becoming kind of like an issue, then it's going to become less uh, of a point to use DMPs. Um, that's an excellent point. Now, if I, if I want to ask you one last question, um, and, and this is a really tough question, I don't know if you would have an answer to it, but um, let's say you are, um, it's 2018 and now let's say at that time, um, you're trying to make the decision of whether to invest more into your existing stack or going and 
and purchasing something off the shelf. Um, and then this is 2018, two years ago, and then you're facing the same thing at 2020. Um, do you think would there be any difference in the decision you would make when back then versus now? That's a, that's a good question, actually, because when I think about how to pitch a CDP, if you already pitched two years ago a DMP and you have to pitch for a CDP this year, to your executives, like, it's going to sound like the same pitch. Like, mm -hmm. two years ago, you promised me all, that, all this already. Yeah. Right, the ability of orchestrating and, and sending the right message to the right person at the right time, all these kind of things, right? So it's a hard thing to say. Like two years ago, uh, I was super excited about starting with Owens Manager, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the, that was the right decision. That yeah. was the, the thing that was missing to do uh, device graph and targeting people and not devices and orchestrating mainly focused on the digital channels. But now mm -hmm. that is expanding, that's growing, right? Now we are talking about outbound channels like email, like push up notifications that they were not part of what we were uh, doing before, right? Uh, I'm not even mentioning digital marketing because that's a whole different beast that usually yeah. I get very upset when I have to work with that. Uh, but uh, at that moment, that makes sense. And the evolution of now they are not only looking at digital channels, but across all the channels, right? If you decide to target a person with this particular offer, how is your agent answering the call know about that and, uh, uh, and keep the conversation aligned with that, right? Mm -hmm. So that is the future and orchestrating that is the key. So maybe if that is the value that you need to consider as CDP instead of a DMP, right? Uh, yeah. You need to ask yourself, what is this thing uh, uh, going allow me to do now, mm -hmm. like or in the future that I cannot do now, right? Yeah. Maybe it's that sync with offline channels. But if you're considering that, I would say like, well, that relies on the APIs to interact with third-party systems. So do you have the resources to actually leverage those APIs? Because mm -hmm. whatever tool you have is going to just give you the APIs so that they can take, you can get it to to your systems. But I'm just I'm meeting you halfway. And giving you the API so you can get it inside your systems. Do you have the people to do that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's a good and point. That, that's important. Um, so yeah, I think it, it, I still think DMP was the right decision two years ago, and uh, I still think there's a lot of things that we a lot that we can leverage from DMPs. Uh, um, not even considering the third party uh, data and the data market place that we can uh, leverage with DMPs. Um, but CDPs have interesting things that if you don't have, again, if you don't have a data science la layer, if you don't have an orchestration layer, if you don't have, or, or, or you don't know how well your governance is, yeah, CDPs are an attractive option. Yep, that's a good point. So, and, and finally, do you think two years from now, in 2022, um, would we be still asking the same question? Do we invest more in our own technology versus going by something off the shelf? I think it's going to be more about uh, how much I'm going to, uh, we're going to let AI to make all the decisions. Okay. Okay. So you're right. really optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I want to, I want to be optimistic. Right. Uh, and, and, and you're right. Like we had in the market technology, uh, constant evolutions of the same uh, business value with different technologies that are promising the same and the same thing, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, right now, everybody's in the platform business. Everybody yep. wants to be the platform for everything mm -hmm. at different levels. Some, some are more like uh, on a SaaS model, more, more, some others are just the platform and then you have to build it everything, but we give you all the uh, performance that you need that you don't have to worry about. Uh, so, but everybody's in the platform business. So you have to decide where are you going to make a decision. The future will be uh, all these extra capabilities with AI and machine learning capabilities that, uh, that will make a difference of how we do things. And that, if I, if I may, like this, this, this takes it to another, uh, another challenge that we have, right? Why are we going to invest in machine learning and all these things if we're still relying on marketing, changing the priorities and overriding 
anything that the machine learning or the AI is telling you because no, you know, I need to sell internet this week. So it doesn't matter if this guy wants to buy a phone, no, push internet. Like yeah. that, those yeah. decisions, all, a lot of the time, it's a very override good point. all the technologies that you put in place. Like, what's the point? Yeah, I think that's the tough job where, as we talk about people in process, also the mindset of how this technology needs to be used, where um, I think in an organization where there's different lines of businesses and they're fighting over the same, um, you know, uh, inventory to be like, hey, like this is the web page. When someone comes in, I really want them to see what we're doing versus another line of business. And when you come and approach to be like, but we have found that this person has a higher affinity or propensity to look at this and buy this, it's a hard way to sell it. Um, I think I think what we have been successfully doing is testing it, proving it, showing the dollar amount at the end. And then saying, guys, end of the day, this company needs to make money. We are able to show this profit. So let's just expand that a little bit. And people more and more buy into it. But it's a very tough sell. Mm -hmm. Very tough sell. Great. Fernando, this has been a pleasure. I, I want to say this is, I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, it's very refreshing to hear from your side, on the brand side, how you guys are doing some incredible stuff. And, and I hope we, we get to do this again and just maybe, maybe not wait another two years, but maybe in a <laughs> bit, just see like how you guys are evolving and, and hear some from our, um, our friends on what questions they have. But this has been great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was fun. All right. All right, guys. We'll see you later. We'll have this up on our website in next week with the recording and also a little bit of an overview of the top things we discussed. In the meantime, if you have any questions for me or Fernando, uh, please reach out. We are on LinkedIn and uh, we're very active there. So, um, Fernando, I'm, I'm volunteering you, but you're, you're open no, to I'm, any I'm, questions. I'm happy yeah. to share. I, I, I like to, to talk about these things. So, yeah. Please. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.